Okay, welcome everyone. Mark Fonville here with uh, Covenant Wealth Advisors. I appreciate you joining the webinar today. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to record this presentation and, and hopefully if we get it through uh, compliance, okay, we'll send it out um, to all of our clients and actually all of our newsletter subscribers. Um, I'm going to, uh, if you've got questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them into the webinar chat or the Q&A and I'll do my best to take a look at those and see if I can answer them. Um, the other way is you can just email me directly at mfonville at mycwa.com um, or of course give me a ring and I'm happy to um, answer any other, other questions um, during client reviews of your client. If you're not a client, um, again, feel free to use the chat or uh, shoot us an email. So today's presentation is entitled Why You Should Avoid Market Timing. And actually, it's um, we're going to walk through quite a bit more than that. Um, but the, the reason for uh, this presentation is that the markets have been pretty chaotic over the last um, 18 months or so. And uh, with last year being the seventh or eighth uh, worst calendar year um, uh, really in history that we have record for, uh, for stocks. And it was the worst calendar year for the bond market uh, since prior to the Civil War, which is about as long as we have um, information for. So considering how poor markets did, um, it can be tough to stay invested. And, and it's times like those when you start to question the wisdom of any approach that you're using for that matter. Um, and then you may you may start to question, uh, ask yourself, gosh, maybe it, should I get out of the market? Should I have gotten out of the market? Should I be timing it? And so we just wanted to really help answer that question, uh, help, help you understand some of the problems that we face. And um, so we're going to walk through that today and, and hopefully give you some good information and some confidence um, about your own plan, your portfolio. If, you, if you're a client, hopefully you already have um, that confidence. If, if uh, you're part of our newsletter, then we'll give you some ideas on, on um, maybe next steps that you can take. Um, again, this is recorded. Uh, nothing in this presentation is considered advice that would require um, a planning or advisory agreement that we would need in place. Um, no past perf uh, past performance is not indicative of future returns. And, and just keep in mind, investing certainly involves risk and the personal risk of uh, loss. So what we're going to walk through, I'll introduce myself a little bit more in detail for those of you who don't know me. Um, we're going to walk through the idea of why invest in the first place. I mean, I think it seems obvious, but, um, but maybe bring up some relevant uh, reasons for that. Um, secondly, um, how do many people invest? Right, so there are a lot of approaches to investing. So, um, what, how do people view investing, just generally as the general public goes? We're going to look at what problems investors face um, throughout time. We're going to talk about, um, of course, the the title of the presentation: Should you time the stock market? And some evidence around that, um, and some I think interesting um, data sets. Um, we're going to talk through how you should consider investing to and through retirement. So it's really for our clients, it's really just a refresher on um, how we invest here at Covenant to give you some, um, some clarity there. Uh, and those who aren't clients kind of give you a framework for what we believe is prudent investing um, uh, leading up to and through retirement. And then finally, really, what are the most important principles that we can kind of capture from this presentation? Um, again, I, I think a lot of you know me, uh, my wife, Catherine, who's in the picture of my family. Uh, we started the firm. She started the firm rather back in 2010. And um, I came on board to run the firm in 2018. Today, we've got um, um, a great group of clients, over 192 families that we serve, that we're really um, uh, proud to have that opportunity to help guide you with your financial decisions. Um, We've got a great team here at Covenant, of course. We've got um, three certified financial planners on the team. We've got a CPA on the team. Um, at all the advisors on the team have over 15 years of experience, which um, we believe is, uh, is really leading uh, in terms of the industry and experience and competence. Um, for the most part, most of the folks that we serve have a million dollars or more in investable assets. They tend to come to us because you 
um, want to create a great lifestyle uh, leading up to and through retirement. You want to create sustainable income um, and you want peace of mind. You don't want to worry about it. You want to be able to enjoy life. Um, and a lot of the folks that come to us, of course, you, you, you just you want to delegate um, the investment in financial side of things. So um, you can focus on the things that are important to you. Um, but we're, we're pleased and we're grateful for the opportunity to, to serve our clients. Um, so to start, let's kind of talk through the idea of, um, you know, why invest in the first place. So many investors really have unfulfilled expectations. They're looking for a better solution, one that can lead to a better investment experience, right? That's the American way. Um, so what would that approach look like? How can they improve their odds of success? So let's begin by considering what you want to accomplish as an investor. Um, why do people invest at all? People have different financial needs and goals, and therefore uh, they may invest for different reasons, right? So one major reason, a reason, of course, is to grow your wealth, for example, in preparation for retirement. Um, whatever your reason for accumulating money, there's another concern that creates the need to invest, um, which is really the, um, the threat of inflation. Right. It's not necessarily something that we feel every every day. Right. Um, but inflation erodes the real purchasing power of your wealth. So consider the illustration that you see in front of you of the effects of inflation over time. So in, in 1920, 17 cents would buy a quart of milk. Um, 50 years later, 17 cents would only buy two cups of milk. And then in 2021, 17 cents would only buy about 11 tablespoons of milk. And of course, you know what inflation's been the last you know, 12, 18 months. So it's, it's even less milk um, just one year later. Um, so really, you know, as the value of a dollar declines over time, you invest to grow your wealth and preserve your purchasing power um, versus not investing and just keeping your money in cash, right? Most of us would probably do that um, if we didn't have inflation or maybe bigger goals down the road. The second reason that we invest is that you've got life goals. Um, and each of you are very unique in that regard. So it might be um, you want to do things with and for your family members. It might be children. It might be your sister or brothers or whoever it may be. It might be that you want to um, travel and go on vacation at times. Um, and to, to have that lifestyle, um, you got to put away money and, and invest it, right? It might be you want a vacation home um, or, or buy a, a, um, another home or add on to your home. It might be that you want to put kids or grandchildren in school. It might be that you want to give to your church or charity, which is something um, uh, that is important to a lot of our clients and, and us as a family. But whatever it is, you have life goals. And so investing isn't, um, you don't invest just because you want more money. Typically, you invest because you want um, to maintain financial security and you want to fund something that's, that's bigger than just the money, right, within life. Um, the other is you, you want the best for your family. So it may be that you have a child who could be um, uh, disabled. It could be that and you want to make sure they're provided for. It could be that you want to help your kids through college or fund a business, or maybe you want to um, um, uh, help the grandchildren, whatever it may be. That's really the third area, I think, that most people um, want to invest. So let's walk a little bit. Um, or talk through a little bit about how many people invest today. So the most common approach is based on prediction and forecasting. Um, you probably get bombarded by spam emails and you see this across the media. And these methods may include picking stocks expected to perform well in the future. It could be moving in and out of industry sectors or just attempting to time the stock market. And these methods are based on trying to predict the future direction of the economy, the stock market, or an individual stock. And this conventional approach assumes that someone really has a crystal ball. Um, many people think that this is the key to successful investing. 
In fact, when people meet a financial advisor like myself or any member of my team, um, um, many, pe many people just want to, um, to ask the question, where do you think the market is going, right? That's a common question that we get as advisors. They're basically asking that person to make a prediction, yet no one can really know the future. And if an investment person could predict the market's future direction, why would he share that knowledge um, for free, right? A prediction about an uncertain future is just really an opinion, and it should not determine anyone's investment decision. And many people, unfortunately, learn this um, the hard way. Um, now, some people approach investing from an emotional perspective. They act impulsively, and the reaction is typically sparked by fear or greed. Um, some may get anxious about the stock market and simply decide to get out. Um, this may ease the, their fear, but it may be replaced by the anxiety of um, what we call FOMO or the fear of missing out, right? The fear of missing out on a market recovery. Um, investors who flee the market ultimately have to decide when to get back in. So if you want to time the market, you got to be right twice. You got to know when to get out and when to ba get back in. And the reality is it's a lot more than that because then you got to do it over a lifetime. Um, the 2008, the 2009 global market downturn offers an example of how the cycle of fear and greed can drive an investor's decisions. Some investors fled the market in early 2009, just before the, the rebound um, began, right? Um, there was a famous prognosticator in March of 2009, um, one of the individuals, a few individuals in the world um, that had predicted um, the, the collapse of the economy in 2008, which by the way, to my knowledge, he didn't actually profit from. But then in March of 2009, he came out again and said um, that the market was going to collapse another 20%. Well, the day he came out with that news was actually the day to be buying into the market. He was completely wrong. Um, you know, so the other side of the emotional coin really is greed. Investors can get anxious about missing out on what they perceive as a great investment, and then they just may follow the crowd. Now, the idea behind investing is to buy low and sell high. I think we've heard that at some time or other, yet following an emotional investment cycle sparked by in, uh, impulsive decisions may bring on the opposite effect, which is buying at high prices and selling at low prices. Um, so other, pe uh, other people approach investing from what we call kind of a, a get rich quick perspective and act on, on tips or hunches. And they may seek out investment insight from uh, cable news programs that feature Wall Street experts who appear to know something valuable or from other sources. Um, and of course, CNBC became popularized because of that. Um, you know, I think uh, many of us have watched uh, Kramer, Jim Cramer, for example. There's also a social element to predictive investing. Um, people like to talk about their winning investments, but they probably don't mention the losers. Right? I've almost never heard anyone mention the losers. Um, I have a close family friend who's, who's, who's been successful in his own right, but, but when we speak about investing, he only tells me about his winners. Right, He never talks about the, 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 the companies that might have gone on, under. Um, people often follow the advice of friends, neighbors, or family, especially if the insight offers um, the potential to make a fast easy return. And, and the reality is, is that most of this advice is just noise, right? It's information. We all know deep down that there's no shortcut at all to growing wealth. Um, so why do people keep investing this way? And, and in some cases, it's really all they know, right? So they don't maybe have any other options. Um, and then finally, the financial and popular media define what investing is for many people, right? The media kind of controls that narrative. Whether the message is crafted by a financial publication, a website, um, cable news program, it often targets human emotion. Um, consider the messages and the, uh, the sample headlines that you see in front of you as an example from major publications. 
Some prey on an investor's fear and anxiety about the future, while others suggest you can tap into a special knowledge to gain quick, easy wealth. Um, and quite frankly, investors who are tempted to act on these media messages should remember the media is selling entertainment, not real financial advice. They have to sell entertainment because they want you to pick up that newspaper. They want you to watch their program because they're selling ad space, right? And sometimes the best advice is really boring, and that doesn't get subscribers or, or get people um, to visit your website necessarily. Now, later in this presentation, I'm going to just share my thoughts on how you may want to consider investing instead. We talked about a lot of the ways here just over the last few minutes about kind of how folks perceive uh, investing and how they act on it. Um, but what I'll walk through a little bit uh, further in presentation is more of an evidence-backed um, approach to investing that may, may be more reliable um, long-term. Okay, so what problems do investors face? Well, the first uh, reality is mental errors. Um, money is very emotional. It's nearly impossible to be fully objective with your own money because of how it ties in um, to your brain. So what you see here is a lot of the mental errors that I think we make as humans. For example, we might say, you know, the market tanked and I should have seen it coming. I've heard that from many investors, right? T talking about um, the, the COVID crash. Um, talking about 2008, talking about the tech crash of 2000, 2001, 2002, right? We always expect that, gosh, someone should have seen this coming, right? It, it couldn't have, it couldn't have uh, just been completely random. Um, something that I wasn't wrong about the stock, just unlucky. unlucky. And that's probably the funniest line because um, when we're right about a stock, we, in, as in the aggregate of investors, we attribute being right to skill. But when the stock didn't we, uh, do well, we attribute to that to just being unlucky, or, or maybe I just didn't look at the evidence enough. And I think it's funny that 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 a lot of times that's our perspective. Um, we might say I work in that industry, so I knew where it was going, right? So if you ha you have a, um, a feeling for a particular industry, um, maybe you profited. Um, and you were in that industry and you thought it was because you're in the industry, but maybe it just so happened that the industry just happened to have done well at that time. Um, so there are mental errors that we make. Um, and so I think that's one of the first problems that we face. The second is um, the, the emotions of investing. This can be really serious. Some of you know uh, my story, how I got into investing. My dad gave me a book when I was 10 years old uh, called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. Um, it was a really neat story, like a thinly disguised biography of this guy named Jesse Livermore, um, who is an infamous trader. He made uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on Wall Street back in the Great Depression. Um, and ultimately, by the way, turned out to be a speculator, not an investor, and ended up dying bankrupt. Um, but I read that book, and that gave me a real passion for investing. And my dad gave me $3,000 to invest probably around 19, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was around 1988. And, um, and so I started investing with my dad. I would trade stocks in and out of the market uh, really for the next um, 10 to 12 years, right? So remember this is 1988. So I was investing from 1988 to um, the basically the year 2000, right? I was uh, born, um, I'm 45 years old. I was born in, in 1978. And, uh, and that was an amazing time. I grew that money from $3,000 up to over um, or close to $100,000 by uh, the year 2000. Um, and what you see in front of you is this kind of emotional roller coaster that I experienced. So in those early years, you know, 88 up to probably 1998, I was experiencing optimism probably in the mid 1990s because my account was growing um, um, at a at a fast clip, you know, I felt pretty smart, um, pretty confident about my decisions. Um, and then you get into the late 1980 or 1990s, 1997, 1998, 1999, and I'm feeling elated. You know, I'm in college at this point. I'm getting my degree in finance at Virginia Tech, uh, and and honestly, I thought I I'd figured it out. I thought I'd figured out. Um, um, how to properly invest. And I'm thinking, gosh, I come home from class and my account's up $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. Um, and so I was really on cloud nine, right? Well, what was going on in the 1990s? Basically, 
if you weren't making money and you're investing in the market, you had the worst luck of all time because just about everybody was making money in the 1990s if they were investing in the stock market because that the direction of the market was going up. Um, so during that time, of course, what came in 1990 or at the end of 1999 and 2000, the tech bust. Well, what also busted was my portfolio, right? And, uh, and I lost most of that $100,000 uh, uh, from about 2000, 2001. And, and someone once told me, never let a crisis go to waste, right? And so I made a decision at that point that I need to learn everything I could so that wouldn't happen again. But when I look back at the mistakes that I made when I was just a student, what I realized is that I just followed this this um, cycle of market emotions, this optimism, elation, nervousness, and then fear. And then when markets are falling, you want to sell out. When markets are doing well, you want to buy in. But the reverse is actually true. What you should be doing is when you're fearful, you should be buying. And when you're elated, you should probably be selling off those winners. Um, and that's something, a process that we call rebalancing the portfolio. Um, but that was one of the mistakes that I did. I, di I didn't do that. The second mistake I did, by the way, was I didn't diversify enough. I only had like five or six individual stock holdings, right? That was a huge mistake. So it's something that's totally controllable. You can, um, you can, you can diversify more to make sure that you capture the market because no one knows which area the market's going to outperform next. So, you know, own the whole market. The third thing I didn't have is I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan for how, what I wanted to do with the money, what my next steps were going to be. And that's easily controllable. Everybody should have a plan. Most people don't. Um, uh, our clients do, but most, most, most Americans really don't have a financial plan. And all of those things are fixable. They're controllable. Um, and a, what a plan does is it helps you manage your emotions because it gives you the steps to take, the things that we can control, so we don't let fear and greed um, guide our decisions. Um, the third problem that we run into is that markets become really volatile. Um, and we, in, when markets are set in motion, we, we believe that markets will continue in that direction. So what you see in front of you, I think this chart is, is super helpful. It shows the return of the S&P 500 index, which is a popular stock market index representing the price movement of the top 500 largest companies in the United States. Uh, you know, it's generally speaking, what, when people refer to, quote unquote, the market, they're referring to the S&P 500. So when you look at each bar here, the blue bars represent where the stock market, um, how in percentage terms, what the stock market did in each calendar year going back to 1980. OK, so you can see in 1980, it was up 26 percent, down 10 percent the next year, up 15 percent, up 17, up only 1 percent. The red dots, those indicate the maximum drawdown for the stock market in that particular year. So if we go back to let's look at something um, this was back, I can't align it perfectly. I think this would have been like two, 2021 here. I believe that looks like somewhere around there, the market was up 27%. But the market was actually down 5% at one point. And so if you were an investor and you started looking at the headlines and the media and everything they're creating to create fear, the market's down 5%, what do you do? Do you stick it out? Do you remain invested? I imagine in this year, in any year, when the market hit its bottom for that year, there were investors who pulled the plug. And in doing so, what they did was they abandoned the return that was there for the taking for any of these years because they didn't stay invested. So every year, the problem that we face is every single year has a, has a drawdown that's well below what we remembered it being. Right. And for those long term investors, um, um, you're rewarded for that risk. And keep in mind, risk and return are related. So if we didn't have these drawdowns in any single year. There would be no reward. Right. You have to have that risk embedded uh, in an investment in order to get the reward long term. So hopefully you find that helpful. I always think this is a really interesting chart. By the way, this last number here, that's year to date. So that's just the S&P 500. Most of our clients are not just in 100% stocks and certainly not just in U.S. stocks. 
Um, but the the maximum drawdown for this individual uh, this year has been eight percent. So if you can imagine that. All right. So should you time the stock market? Um, I think you probably know the answer to this by now, but I'm going to show you some data on this. The answer is no. I don't think you should time the stock market. I think it creates a lot of problem. I think it deteriorates wealth. I think it increases cost. I think it creates unnecessary taxation. And the evidence would suggest that, that is the case, um, even though emotion would uh, would um, you know dictate that we want to time the market. Um, I like this visual here because everyone has been in this situation. So I can't tell you how many times I've been driving down the highway and, you know, it could be a two lane highway or three lane highway. And I'm always looking for the fastest lane, right? I'm trying to, uh, to uh, get in the lane that'll get me to my destination the fastest. And that's not unlike the stock market, right? You're in one lane, you're in one type of investment or one area of the market. And then suddenly you see on the news that this other area of the market is doing much better. And so what do you want to do? You want to change lanes. By the time you change lanes, what happens? You, your lane starts slowing down. And then you look at the lane that you're in, that starts speeding up. And you look at your spouse or your loved ones, and you, and you just kind of nod your head every time, right? It, you never get it perfect. And the reality is, had you just stayed in a lane, you probably would have gotten there faster. You would have used less gas. You would have had less wear and tear on your, um, on your car. And it would have been safer because you're not changing in and out of lanes, almost creating an accident. Well, markets are very similar. So um, the reality is that many people think they need to predict where prices are going to get ahead, but this is just not re required to outperform um, stock markets. Okay, let me give you a, an example here. So uh, this was uh, Reuters, January 10th, 2012, an announcement comes out. Orange juice futures surged the records um, on fungicide fears. Okay, so um, what ends up happening is that these futures end up doing doing well with oranges. Okay, and the news is reflected in the price of the stock or um, this investment almost immediately. Right. So. So the price here at $32, the news is already known, but now you're reading it. So you're questioning, what should I do? Well, the reality is it's already built into the price. What moves um, the price of oranges or any other fruit tomorrow has nothing to do with the news today. It has to do with the news tomorrow, which is unpredictable. Another way to look at this is um, back in 2017, there was rumor that Burger King um, was was out to bid or buy the restaurant Popeyes. Okay, so here's where the stock price was um, um, at the time. And then the rumors started to fizzle out. And so the price started to, to decline almost instantly. And then the next thing you know, news comes out that yes, indeed, Burger King is going to buy Popeyes. The price instantly goes up that exact day and then it just levels out, right? Here's the deal terms of the buyout. And so think about that. That happened so quickly because the news was embedded into um, that announcement and that price instantly. And so looking at that news wouldn't have benefited investors at all in that situation. So what happens if you, if you try to time getting it out of the market or try, trying to predict when to be in stocks or when to be in bonds? I think this is a, kind of a classic um, example of the impact on the growth of wealth. So what you see here um, is the, the impact of missing the best market days over the past 25 years based on an initial $1,000 investment using the S&P 500 returns before transaction costs, okay? So column one assumes that you invested $1,000 um, starting 25 years ago. You just kept it invested. That money grew to $3,250. This next column assumes that you missed the number one best day over that time frame. So why would you have missed the best day? Well, the best days in the stock market very often happen after the worst days. But if, but if you're reading the media and, you're, and your portfolio is down and you get out of the market, the likelihood that you miss the next best day, the uptick in the market is very high. 
right? And so in this example, had you missed just the one best day, your return from having stayed fully invested would have gone from $3,250 to only $2,913. So a several hundred thousand or a several hundred dollar uh, difference in return by missing that one best day. Now, what happens if you miss the best five days? Well, suddenly your return drops by nearly $1,200 from having just stayed invested during that full time frame. Miss the best 10 days. Again, your $1,000 only grew to $1,500. If you miss the best 20 days, you actually lost money. Miss 30 best days, you, you, you cut your um, portfolio nearly in half. And then, of course, if you miss the best 40 days, you know, you're down by 70% or so. So that's pretty significant and kind of gives the um, evidence as to why it, it, if you're out of the market, you know, you can't, you can't get the gains when the market comes back and it can hurt portfolios. Here's a different way to look at market timing. So since 2009, the effect of exiting the market the day after each of the 20 worst days, that's what you see in front of you. So, um, so for example, let's say you invested in 2009 uh, in the S&P 500. And um, over that time frame, you stayed invested. So in this example, that money grows to $6,518. So we'll kind of use that as the base um, baseline. Let's say in, in this scenario, what you do after 20 of the worst days, so you have one of, the, one, of, one of the 20 worst days, you get out of the market the day after, and you stay out a week. So you stay out a week, and then you get back into the market. So that $1,000 investment grows to $5,628. So by timing it, it's worse than just having stayed fully invested. Let's look, look at it differently. What if you got out after the worst day and then you stay out for two weeks? Well, your investment, a little better, $5,990. What if you get out, and by the way, I've never really seen, there are day traders, we'd recommend highly against that. But I've never really seen um, investors who say, just get me out for a week, I'll get back in. Usually it's a little bit longer than that. If they want to do that, our clients don't typically do that. Um, but let's say they want to be out for a month or a quarter. If you're out for three months, so you sell after the worst day, you stay out for three months, and then you reinvest, that $1,000 could have been $6,500, but instead it's $4,500. And then if you stay out for one year, which, by the way, people call us all the time telling us mistakes that they made, that they sold out in 2008 and they didn't get back in, back in for a year or two or three, right? That is reality. Some people do that if you don't have a plan and discipline around it. That $1,000 only grew to $1,694, substantially less than just staying fully invested. And so when we look at the evidence around market timing, it just shows that it's sim it simply it doesn't work very well. The, the odds of it working are, are extremely low. And those who do it, we would argue that just they were successful over time um, uh, due to luck rather than skill. Um, so hopefully you found that helpful. So what do we do, right? How should we consider investing um, to and through retirement? Well, the first is put evidence on your side, right? You, you, it's like um, in medicine, for example, if a new uh, medication comes out or uh, a new vaccine, of course, has been in the news for the last couple of years. But if you come out with a new medication, there has to be substantial clinical trials um, and testing done to, to ensure that uh, that medication is going to be safe for the public, right? Well, when it comes to investing, a lot of folks, as we talked about, they just invest based on a whim or based on emotion, right? There's no evidence behind it. There's, 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 um, uh, there are no white papers kind of guiding that decision. So what we'd say is that use the evidence. It's there. There's been a lot of research around investing that's, that's based um, in information that makes sense. Um, when we implement portfolios for individuals, for our clients, um, the ideas that we get come from all of these individuals that you see in front of you. Um, Adam Smith was kind of the, the founder of this idea of capitalism. Um, 
Harry Markowitz, um, who I've met several times. He used to be on our investment committee at um, a prior firm, won the Nobel Prize in economics in, in um, 1990. Um, Daniel Kahneman, he's a, won the Nobel Prize. He uh, around this idea of what we call behavioral finance, if you ever knew there was such a thing, right? It's like the behaviors that occur uh, when people invest. Um, uh, Mayor Statman is a professor of finance at Santa Clara University. Um, you've got um, Gene Fama, who I've met multiple times and, and been in classes with at University of Chicago. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 2013. And so, you know, the, the reason these there have been so many accolades is because um, kind of like medicine, these folks have published papers that have been scrutinized by others within the financial um, community. And so um, that's robust data, it's robust information, and that's what we want to incorporate when we make decisions for our clients, right? We just don't want to invest on a whim. Um, so, so what's the best way to invest? Well, this is an interesting exercise, and I actually remember doing this back um, when I was, I believe, in first grade uh, growing up in Richmond, Virginia. And my teacher had this huge jar of jelly beans. And uh, what she had asked everyone in the room to do was to guess how many jelly beans are actually in that jar. Well, a lot of folks have actually replicated this study. And in this study you see here, this was a financial advisory firm did it with their clients. So the, the advisor asked their clients um, at a client event, guess how many jelly beans are in the jar? And the range of guesses was from between 409 jelly beans to 5,365 jelly beans. Um, so the average of all of the guesses miraculously came to 1,653 the actual amount of jelly beans was 1,670. So what's interesting here is that the average guess was the best answer, right? It, it outperformed any individual guess of uh, those who submitted the guesses. And markets are, are not unlike that, right? So markets are, um, aggregate the guesses of all participants. And the best way to participate in that, we believe, is by owning the whole market um, uh, through either index funds or uh, through what we call asset class funds, which are just diversified investments that own the whole market in different segments. Um, so the second thing here, um, so own the market, but let markets work for you. Um, markets work over time. Uh, in, in the short term, markets go up and down, but historically, uh, they've gone up, up over the long term. And what you can see here, I think is one of the most interesting charts when it comes to investing is the growth of a dollar over time in different um, indexes or segments of the stock market. So if you had invested a dollar back in 1926, um, that dollar would have declined during the depression and then rebounded. And then the, the ending value here, not including expenses, would have uh, come to $28,668 by the end of 2022, pretty substantial. So U.S. small companies tend to do the best over the long term, at least historically. No guarantee going forward, of course. Um, U.S. large companies, so i.e. the S&P 500 index that we talked about before, you know, ended up over $11,000. So these are substantial. These are stocks. Down here, the more conservative investments, long-term bonds, and then and then treasury bills. Um, so for our clients, we invest in uh, short-term, very high-quality bonds. Uh, we do that for stability, but certainly not for a return, right? So if you look at the return of a dollar over that time frame in U.S. Treasury bills, that dollar only ended up being $22 over that long time frame, right? That's not enough to counter um, the purchasing power that you need to outpace inflation. So what you can see is let markets work for you. They do work over the long haul. What doesn't work over the long haul are people. It's people problems. Markets have people problems. And that is they try to time the market. They try to pick the next hot stock. They try to, um, um, you know, take take the next best idea from their friend or family member. And, and ultimately, you don't have to do that. I think we've uh, kind of talked through that. The second is that um, there are great companies throughout the world. And uh, 
a CEO, an owner of a company, their goal is to create a great product or service so they can sell that product or service and, and grow revenue. That doesn't matter. And, and that stays the same, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Japan or the United Kingdom, wherever you are, that's really the goal. And so when we invest money, we're investing in those great ideas across the world. Um, and so what you see in front of you, this is a, a map of the world. Um, so you'll notice each country, United States, for example, here is in its geographic accurate location. United States, you got Canada to our north, Japan uh, over to the far right, United Kingdom. The size, though, in this in this illustration is not based on the land mass. Rather, it's based on the size of the stock market. So what we call market capitalization for each country. So um, year ending 2022, the United States stock market, which is about 3,609 companies, that represented about 59% of the worldwide stock market. So what that tells us is that 40% or 41% of the opportunity for investment is actually not in the United States, right? And so when you build out the, a, a prudent investment portfolio, um, we believe that certainly you should have investments in U.S. markets, but you should also have them spread out to different countries across the globe um, because we just don't know where the next best idea is going to come from. Um, the third area is, all right, well, we talked about don't time the market, you know, own a broadly diversified bucket of stocks and bonds, but how can you possibly improve returns within your portfolio if stock market timing doesn't work, if trying to pick the next hot stock doesn't work? And that's where a lot of the evidence um, that we use comes into play. And what you see in front of you is really a, um, a map that guides our decisions on helping improve expected returns going forward. Yeah, not guaranteed returns, but expected returns to help improve, uh, potentially improve growth. And what you see, if, if we divide the stock market up, there's small companies and large companies, and then value companies and growth companies. So value companies are um, essentially low-priced stocks. Growth companies are higher-priced stocks. And what we know is that risk and return are related. And so in the stock portion of a portfolio, some of you might have only 40% stocks in your portfolio. Some of you might have 60% stocks. But for the, the stock portion, what we found is that small companies tend to outperform large companies over time. And value companies tend to outperform growth companies over time. It doesn't happen all the time or in every single period. Nothing, nothing works that way but over time. And so what we wanna do is we wanna own all of these, but we wanna tilt your portfolio on the stock portion toward these smaller companies and more value companies. And we do that again to improve the expected returns over time um, and hopefully grow your wealth um, at, a, at a faster rate. Um, this compared to trying to get in and out of the market, speculating a lot of the stuff that we talked about that quite frankly, I don't think in the evidence shows doesn't work very well over time. Okay, so kind of getting near the end here. Um, there's a lot in this presentation. Hopefully it's been helpful. I'm just going to quickly kind of walk through some of the most important principles. Um, to invest prudently, you need a plan. You need to start with the end in mind. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we going toward, right? You can't, if you're traveling, if you're going to California, you kind of got to know where you're going in, uh, in California before you um, kind of establish the game plan for getting there. Um, and the same is true with investing. So you need a plan. Your plan should include at the highest level, like, all right, what is our lifestyle going to look like? What do we want life to look like? What's important to us? If we're uh, not to be grave here, but if, if we're on our deathbed and we're looking back, what are we thinking about that really um, uh helped us make an impression on life. What am I happy about, right? I guarantee that most of you won't think, well, gosh, I, I uh, had the best investment ever, right? What you might be thinking about is I've got financial security for my spouse. Um, I spent time with my loved ones. Um, I provided for them, right, um, th throughout time, you know, all of those things. But a plan starts at a high level, and then it starts to break down on 
okay, what things can we focus on that we can control? In terms of investments would be, we can control diversification, we can control risk, we can um, help manage taxes, reduce taxes. Um, we can also control our spending, we can control our saving. Um, on, the, on the other side, it could be, we can control our state planning, right? Having wills, trusts in place and all of those other things. The second, I think, um, principle is that be an investor, don't be a speculator. Um, most people speculate when they think they're investing um, and, and there's a better way. You know, the investing is really about um, expecting a return on where you put your money versus speculating is really about hoping for a return. A good example of this would be Bitcoin. Bitcoin is speculation. It's been in the news for, for many years. It's extremely vo volatile. Nobody really has a clue where the price of Bitcoin will go, but there are a lot of speculators out there uh, trying to guess, which, which is not much different than the roulette table uh, in Las Vegas. Um, and so what I would suggest is what you want to do is you want to invest in companies that have an expectation of growing um, revenues and growing their product and creating cash flow, right? It's those types of companies where we expect a return. Not all of them will be successful, but that's why we diversify. And so be an investor, not a speculator. The third is um, have an investment philosophy and stick with it. You know, at, at Covenant, we have a very clear investment philosophy. We have a very clear investment process. And the reason is that um, every day gives us a reason to be scared of markets. We as in just investors. And if you don't have um, principles to guide you, um, you're going to get beaten down and, and you're going to make bad decisions. And it's, it's not um, unlike raising kids and our family values are really important to us. We talk about our values with our children. And we talk about values um, because when they're off on their own and they have decisions to make where the answers aren't black and white, they're gray, what they're going to rely on is the values that they learned um, when we raised them. And so I believe that, that investing is the same way. You got to have these principles that help guide your decisions, even though the future um, isn't uh, necessarily black and white. Those principles will really help you get closer to your goal long term, and the evidence um, shows that. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that markets are guaranteed. It doesn't mean that life is guaranteed. Um, you know, I I know to exercise and I know to eat well and eat my vegetables and you know eat less carbs. It doesn't mean I won't um, have a heart attack when I go home tonight. But what it does is it means that it improves my odds of success, and that's that's really what I think having an investment approach. Um, based on evidence um, does for our clients and investors. Um, so with that said, I'm going to, um, we're, we're at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, um, you know, certainly go ahead. There should be like a, a Q and a icon. If you can find it on your, um, uh, on your panel there, if you see the chat box, you can type it in there. I'll look at both. Um, um, and again, if you don't have any questions, that's okay. If you think of a question after um, today, uh, just let me know. If, if you're not a client, you want a free consultation, just visit our website, covenantwealthadvisors.com, um, and we can talk about how we might be able to, to help uh, you with your uh, money decisions. So I'll just pause, um, see if there are any uh, questions out there or, or uh, comments. So there's a, um, we don't have any questions, but I'll, I'll raise something that sometimes comes up or, or sometimes you might think about, we get this from clients and, and other investors that we talk to is um, what are, what should expected returns be going forward? And I think it's a, uh, it's a smart thing to think about because it sets proper expectations. When we, um, when we build a portfolio and we invest for our clients, we create something called an investment policy statement. And in there we have what are reasonable expected returns going forward. 
over a 10 year time frame. And um, and when you look at a the, the stock market long term, you know, you might see uh, the return should be somewhere around inflation plus four or five percent. So if inflation's at zero, then expected returns going forward may be around four or five percent. But if inflation's at say five percent, you know, you might see expected returns at higher than that. Um, but most people don't have just all stocks, right? You have a mix of bonds and stocks. And so when you have that mix, say 60% stocks, 40% bonds, um, your expected return should probably be more in the line of two, three, four percent above inflation. So that could be different based on any different time frame. Um, but it should give you good um, a good estimate of all right, what should we plan for? When we do financial planning uh, for clients, we use really conservative rates of return around four to five percent long term. And we do that because markets can produce abysmal returns for periods of time. Um, and if we do better, great, that just makes your plan look better. Um, but we want to err on the side of being conservative. The key, though, is that you can't get those returns without enduring bad times. Um, we we kind of opened up with the uh, the conversation around 2000. Um, well, COVID, when things crashed last year, when the market crashed, like that is part of the ride. And you're, you're going to see downturns every single year. Um, and if you're diversified enough, I think um, you'll reward yourself by staying invested to get what those expected returns are going forward. So if you have more questions about that, what expected returns can be, what the downside could be in, the, in bad years, let us know if we haven't spoken to you about it. Um, and we can show you some data um, to give you some confidence around it. Other than that, I don't see any questions. So thank you so much. I hope this was enjoyable. Again, we recorded it, so hopefully we'll get it out. We're going to try to do more of these going forward. If you've got ideas on, on what you'd like to hear from us, shoot us an email and, uh, and let us know. So thanks so much. Have a great day. Uh, happy 4th, everybody. Take care.